The other tool is attention. Where do you focus your awareness? What do you look at? What do you notice? I've come to recognize as we have this question about is the glass half full or is it half empty? And I've come to the conclusion that it's actually both. And if I look at the full part, I have one experience. If I look at the empty part, I have a different experience. I spent the first many years of my son's life looking at the empty parts of my son. I looked at all the things that Josh couldn't do. And when I looked at my son that way, I suffered, and so did he. Somewhere along the way, I got taught how to see the full parts of my son. And I would like to tell you that story because I think it's an important one. It was actually Josh's grade 7 teacher who taught me how to see my son different. And it was the year Josh was going into grade 7 and the school that he was attending, which was a middle school in Port Coquitlam, there was enough students that year for two grade 7 classes. And it just so happened that both of the teachers that year were men and both of them were crazy about sports. They decided that the way they were going to divide up the students was to flip a coin. Whoever won the coin toss got first pick. And then they would alternate picks back and forth until all the students were assigned. And when I tell this story and there's teachers in the audience, they often cringe a little bit because that's not how you're supposed to assign students. But that's what these two fellows did. So they flipped the coin. A teacher by the name of Jeff won the coin toss, and so he picks up this list of about 70 students, and he goes over the names, trying to figure out who to choose first. And after about a minute of thinking, he decides to choose my son with his first pick. And the other teacher is confused. And he says, Jeff, I don't get it. Like he said, I don't know all the kids on the list, but I know Josh. Josh is pretty hard to miss. And he said, I know that on that list is bright kids, on that list is great athletes, on that list is funny kids, on that list is good-looking kids, on that list is cooperative kids. And instead, you choose a child that has an uncontrolled seizure disorder, that has the capacity of a two-year-old, that needs to be toileted, needs to have all of his curriculum modified. And then you picked him with your first pick. Help me understand. And Jeff was one of those amazing people that saw my son different. And he said, well, let me tell you what I've noticed. He said, I've watched Josh around the school the last couple of years. And he said, actually, more important, I've watched the other kids around Josh. I watch how eager they are when he comes into the school and how they want to take turns pushing his wheelchair to the classroom. I watch how they'll assist him to get his coat off and get him into his desk. I watch how... They'll modify the rules of the game during recess or during gym to include Josh in the game. I notice how they'll take a sandwich at lunch and break it into smaller pieces so that Josh can eat it more easily. I notice how they'll sit or lay beside him after he's had a seizure and they'll hold his hand and stroke his forehead. And how they'll whisper in his ear that he'll be okay. And what I notice is, is that when they're around Josh, they're kinder and gentler. And so I think that if I have Josh Kuntz in my class, that it will be a kinder and gentler place for all kids to learn. Now, there's somebody who didn't see Josh's disability. He saw Josh's gift. And Josh's gift wasn't what Josh does, because Josh really doesn't do very much. But Josh's way of being in the world was the gift. And Jeff told me that story quite by accident a number of months after school started, and it caused me to cry, because I realized I was like that other teacher. I saw all the things Josh couldn't do. And I actually saw much of life that way. I looked at the things that weren't happening and got angry. I looked at people's deficits and had judgment. And so I've come to recognize is what we focus our attention on is absolutely critical. And quantum physicists understand this. They say everything in the universe is energy. The chair you're sitting in is energy. Your body is energy. And even your thoughts are energy. And when you place your thought on something, you energize it. And the more that you think about it, the more that you energize it, the more that it manifests. And so it's science. It's not 
fuzzy stuff. So I've learned it's important to notice where I place my attention. I've noticed it's important to declare my intention. That my mind is a valuable tool and it can be used constructively and it can be used destructively. It can be used creatively and it can be used reactively. If you've read the Conversation with God books by Neil Donald Walsh, he's got a nice little piece of wisdom in his book about this. He says, take the word create and write it on a piece of paper. Below it, write the word react. And then he says, what's the difference between the two words? And the simple answer is the C is in a different place. And he says, if you want to create something, you have to see first. <laughs> see, I believe that we're very powerful beings. In my office and in my home, I have that Michelangelo painting where the hand of God is extended to the hand of man. I'm sure most of you are familiar with it. It's a classic. What you may not know is the name of the painting. The title of the painting is called Creation. And I'm not sure what Michelangelo had in mind, but I'll tell you what I get out of that painting and out of that title. I believe it's what's being passed from the hand of God onto the hand of man is the ability to create. That when the Bible and other books says that we're made in the image and likeness of God, it doesn't mean that we look like God. It means that we too can create like the great creator. And I've come to recognize that when I embrace that, when I live my life creatively, it's an incredible experience. What I've learned is that the act of creation is actually one of the most joyful things that we do in life. And that you can make every moment and every day an act of creation and as a result, being a place of joy. Now again, what I've come to recognize is that I live life reactively for most of it. Life would show up, I would react. Life would show up, I would react. I acted like I wasn't in charge of my own life. In the counseling profession, and particularly in drug and alcohol work, one of the metaphors that we sometimes use is the metaphor, a question of who's driving your bus. And what that question refers to is, that, is the suggestion that life is like being on a bus. Now the question is, is that are you the driver of the bus or are you a passenger complaining about where the bus is going? And what I noticed, I spent most of my life as a passenger complaining. And when I climb into the driver's seat and I start to drive my bus, my life becomes significantly different. And so one of the most powerful tools I learned about peace and joy and happiness is about using my imagination constructively and creatively.